there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. Nelson Mandela. To be honest with you, I was just so scared that there's no way I'll stand there, so I ran away. I grew up in over 20 places, uh, foster homes, group homes, detention centers. Why is she, why is she leaving? Why are they here? Why are they taking her from me? Being in foster care is just, it's just a different tone of life. Like, you, you will want to be around your real family, but they don't want you. That's a terrible feeling. The crisis really involves the fact that we simply have insufficient number of homes. We have about 500 or so uh, foster homes right now, but there are on average 2,000 kids in foster care on any given day in Milwaukee. One third of all the children um, in the state of Wisconsin um, that are in foster care come out of Milwaukee County. We're not growing at the same rate as kids are coming into our system. It seems like the older the kids get, the less foster parents are willing to take them in. So when you're talking kids eight and above, it's extremely hard to place a child. A few months back, I had a conversation with a few people about the foster care crisis, and my mind was completely overwhelmed and blown away by the tragedy and the dramatic instances that are happening in our neighborhoods and in our backyards. I went to the juvenile justice then found out my mom had gotten convicted of a crime, so she ended up doing a year and a half in prison and when she went there they tried to find a place for me and all the family members that I stayed with for years didn't really want to accept me at the time anymore so they found the foster care and there was it was a really hard childhood mm -hmm. it wasn't a very I don't know how to say it like happy, happy home I mean there were happy times um, but I think I was a very resilient child. We, I don't remember how, but we went to Halo, the homeless shelter here in Racine, and we were there for a good hour. And then I was eating dinner, and then it was time to go to sleep. Then the front, the front door, police came, and they asked for my biological mom. My mom tried to find a place, tried to help out, but she couldn't. But I remember just crying hard, you know? This tough little kid thought he was tough, and now you're being removed from your mother, and she's going off. And you never really knew how much you loved your parents until you separate from them. Yeah. There was a lot of abuse in the home. And you just kind of have to survive. Around this time, me telling one of my counselors that my birth mom was hitting me. And I had like knots in my head, like on my head, and bruises. And um, the, the school nurse examined me, called my birth mom in, and um, of course she lied, you know, she said that that didn't happen. And I was sent home and I was given a choice to be um, spanked by her or George when he got home. And either one was bad, so I just said, do it now and get it over with. You know, you just got beat up for <laughs> telling somebody that there was stuff going on at home. And I was told, um, I'll leave bruises on your body where people won't be able to see it. So next time you tell somebody, they won't believe you. So they asked for her and she went in there. And about five minutes later, they started to arrest her. Uh, she was, you know, fighting with them. And I was crying and very uh, upset, not knowing what was going on. It was 24 hours I was gone. Where'd you go? She's back to the streets. How long were you I on was the on a run. Stay on the streets for a couple years, you know. Can you, what, what does that mean? Well, staying on the streets. Just living, I'm um, going to cousins' houses and police come, I leave. And I ran away from home and I was gone for two weeks. I was gone for two weeks and I lived in my friend's old camper and I ate stale donuts. And then I slept in someone's um, basement of a kid that I met. There, was, there were random people there and a random guy actually uh, raped me in that basement. And then 
I was distraught about why is she why is she leaving why are they here why are they taking her from me and then I was took by a social worker in a car and drove to a person's house that I did not know and not knowing where I was and I went to sleep hi, hi how are you good Come on in, have a seat. Thanks. So when children come into care in Racine County, we always attempt to make the first placement the best placement. When kids are removed from their home, it's a traumatic situation. And so if we place them in multiple homes, we increase their, their trauma level and, and, and their crisis for them. So the more homes I have to pick from, the better off I am. Yeah. But we struggle and we oftentimes have kids that are sitting here in our office building for hours at a time while we search for a foster parent who's willing to take them. To them, they're losing everything. They're losing the home that they've known for how long, the parents, the, they may lose their school friends, they may lose the school that they attend depending on where they're placed depending on how long they're placed for. Um, there's so many things that they could lose their pet. I mean, yeah. you're, they're gonna leave and there's a dog there that they see every day and they interact with. And now you're telling them that dog can't go with them. I remember we came home from school and my sister and I walked in and there was a woman that, our pastor's wife, and then there was a social worker and my mom wasn't there and there was just um, a garbage bag and we were told to fill it with things as quick as we could and to kind of go with them and that you know they had to take my mom to the doctor she wasn't doing well and that we would see her soon. I kept being frustrated because I could get them connected with a lot of resources. I could get them connected with food share and housing assistance and all of health insurance, all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, I kept realizing that these families, what they really needed was they were alone. They were socially isolated. And unfortunately, what I would see oftentimes in my world was these kids would end up where we called upstairs because that was the Child Protective Services Unit. Um, and so it just, it was a constant point of frustration. And there was one young woman in particular that I started working with and getting involved with. And at the point that my husband and I became involved with her and started advocating for her, it was a little too late in the process. We just kept asking, like, what if, what if we would have known her two years ago? What if we would have met her sooner? What if the community would have been aware of this young woman that was walking amongst them every day and, and going to one of the schools there in town? And what if somebody would have identified her sooner? That's when we started to look at safe families as as something different, it's not foster care. And foster care is, is much needed. Hey, do you guys have a few minutes for a few questions? Um, but basically there's more kids entering the system. There's like this steady increase, um, but there's not enough people opening up their homes. So whose problem do you think that is? Uh... Probably everybody. I think it's everyone's problem. I mean, honestly, even if like, I'm, I've never been married, I've never had children, but I want children someday, and those children are our generation, our future generation, so obviously it affects everyone around us. How much do you feel like your knowledge level is on foster care from a one to a 10? 10 being like you know everything, one being you know nothing. Four. Uh, maybe just awareness, people don't know. Yep. Um, and I think that's a big key is, you know, knowing that there's a problem, an epidemic. What, what's the deal? Like, what's the problem? Like, why is there such a big, not only need, but a lack of homes? Like, people simply don't know the need that exists and they live next to these individuals, they live next to these families, their kids go to school with these kids. But when we look at people, we just assume that everything's okay and we don't ask the right questions. And I think, um, that people think the government's just taking care of it and don't understand that the assistance is needed. I think there's um, misconceptions that foster parents make a lot of money during foster care, and it's simply not true. It takes a village to raise a child. All of those wonderful you know, sayings that, that go with it are true because 
it works. I think the prison is getting, I think the jails are getting packed. You know, I think parents are getting um, incarcerated. I think um, uh, families are um, addicted to drugs. Yeah. It's, that's and that's growing too. I know the numbers and in, um, incarceration is growing. Kids in juvenile justice, all that is growing. You know, yeah. I think all that, and then it's a lot of families are um, in poverty. That's growing. So I think all that plays a part with each other. The drug addiction that is out there is overwhelming the system with children day in and day out. Um, approximately 100 children per month are being detained, and we need good homes for these kids. I think the need to deal with children that are being abused or have experienced trauma is off the charts. When you look at the statistics, say one out of three to four kids will be sexually abused alone by the time they're 18. Then when you look at physical, emotional, or neglect, and we look at a society that's kind of broken down, stress, and a lot of different internal additions, including addictions in the home, I think there's a lot more of it going on that we're even have hit the tip of the iceberg. The reason why there's a crisis is simply because people don't realize or know how horrific the situation really is. Basically that there's not enough homes for children and the actual rate of children entering the system is increasing. In some regards, society is becoming more um, selfish in its sense to I gotta take care of myself first. Um, I think a lot of people feel ill-equipped uh, to be able to welcome a child um, or a teenager into their home. There's, I think partially has to do with, you know, how the media portrays the foster systems, all these you know bad kids and stuff. Not just media, but it's also like you know TV shows and stuff. All these foster kids are terrible kids, and it's hard to deal with them, and so it kind of turns people away from it. Yeah, don't you think it's interesting because the kids are the ones that are the victims right. in this situation? Yes, but they're the ones that get the bad rap. Like they're the like horrible children. Yeah, because, uh, where I'd say it's humanity's responsibility to care for humanity, and we'll be we suck at it. So I would say it's your responsibility and my responsibility and your responsibility is to figure out how to be advocates. Um, and as I say it, I'm humbly aware of the fact that I. Uh, I haven't done a great job. In your own words, what is foster care? Oh gosh, that's a sacrifice like no other. That's giving up your your heart for, gosh, just the future of a child. And a lot of these moms and dads, but moms is who I've met, yeah. um, are desperately in love with these kids. They really are desperately in love with these kids. Not all of them. Uh, but they're desperate in love with these kids, um, but they're not in a place right now uh, where they should be raising a child. Um, so many of our birth parents, and knowing that so many of them are victims themselves, so many of them were raised in foster care. They were the kids that people like me 20 years ago took care of, and now they're parenting in the way that they were parented, and now their kids are in care. When we saw, when we discovered Safe Families, it had started in Chicago about 15 years ago by a child psychologist. He had worked with um, children and families in the child welfare system for many years, and he had kind of come to the same conclusion. And he just went home thinking, this is ridiculous. Like, this woman came to us and she said, I need help. Um, but the point at which we can get involved, our agency can get involved, is the point when that child has already been harmed. Why wouldn't we want to intervene sooner and, and catch that family sooner? And so, um, so he started Safe Families for Children. And it's just been, the program itself is, is set up similar to foster care in the sense that we do take children into our homes. Uh, we screen our families the same, so they go through background checks and fingerprints and home studies and training. Um, but they work as volunteers and we place children temporarily in their homes, but it's all voluntary. The parents coming to us and saying, you know what, I need to get treatment for my drug addiction, or I'm homeless, or I'm, I need to get out of this domestic violence situation. And then our families will temporarily care for those children. It's, it's quite a different model because it's voluntary. It's families coming alongside of other families and saying, let us help, let us be involved. Don't live in isolation anymore. Come in and be a part of the community. The term foster and foster care, foster kids, is familiar enough to the average person, people like me that we don't actually give it much thought. We just think in our minds that it's being taken care of. The solution is individuals that actually do something about it, that make up what we call society. It's each and every one of us recognizing that these children are not just someone else's responsibility, that we're the solution, not the government, not some other agency out there, but you and I have a part to play on some level. Awesome. <laughs>
<laughs> That's lighthearted. Light -hearted. <laughs> and she had actually been in and out of foster care several times. And then she, her mother had had a baby brother, and the baby was um, crying and crying in the apartment. And a neighbor finally called the police. And when the police got there, they found her mom passed out. She was an alcoholic, and the baby had just been screaming and screaming. So the children were taken away, and they were placed into another home um, one by one. They let the three children go, and Sophia was the first. It was ironic that they lived right around the corner from us. And um, I'll never forget the day the caseworker showed up with her, this cute little girl with her braids and this big, huge smile, and just came skipping into the driveway. You walk into somebody else's house, you don't know them, they don't know you, you don't know where you're staying, and at the time, you're just sort of adjusting. Um, it really is kind of messing with your psyche and your peace of mind, and you're always on edge and you're always on guard, and I think that's a hard Thing for a lot of people who don't go through that to understand because if you've always had the comfort of parents or of a home or something then you don't understand what it's like that you could possibly just be moved in a split second. So our mom came to us one day and asked us if we would adopt them if she terminated her rights and we said yes. So it was about a year and eight months later we um, adopted both of them and made them legally ours. That's the one credit that I can give my mom, even though I'm not particularly close to her, is that she understood that flaw and understood that she couldn't take care of us and understood that they could do a better job. So she did ask and then, yeah, she that's did That's very ask. heroic of her. I think there's a, there's a lot of stigma um, that's wrapped around foster kids. You know, I, I read some comments um, what if these kids have been abused? What if they abuse my kids? Well, I was abused, and I never abused anyone. I just needed affection and love mm -hmm. and, a, and a good, safe home. Him, he was seven, and he was adorable. And <laughs> he kind of stole my heart, totally. But there's this big question of, like, what would cause someone to do this? Like, what would cause someone to inconvenience their life, especially you being a single woman, having a career, all of those things, you know what I mean? To, to bring another life into your life. I feel like that's why I'm here. That's my purpose. One of the reasons why those of us who are fostering stay foster parents is because fostering isn't what we do, it's who we are. It just becomes who we are. What do you think, having been in foster homes, what do you think is the number one thing that a kid that's entering a foster home, what does he need? Security, knowing that they can come home to a home every day, knowing that it's food every day, knowing that they can go to sleep every day. Clothes are gonna be washed and be clean every day. Just the, the, the little but big things, you know? Yeah. They're little things, I look at my kids, I'm like, you don't have to worry about any of those. Statistically, the ADA told me that I would amount to nothing, right? I, I told you that. Yeah. And statistically, I should not be caring for kids, I should probably will be, either be dead or on the streets, drug addict, um, prostitution. It blows my mind that I am being used to help children heal in all types of ways. My mom and dad are amazing people. They could have had a, a, a son and a daughter and then been done and their life would have been just fine. Peach. Exactly, it really would have. And I wouldn't, I, I just, I always said I wouldn't, I wouldn't have kept me. And I think that's the biggest act of love is when, and that's just what I've been recognizing, just how much they did do that I didn't see. And From this day forward, this child shall be known as Jalen, J-A-Y-L-I-N. Congratulations. I feel like somebody wants to be with me, that someone wants to be there for me, take care of me, be a parent that I've never had before. It's helped me learn how to love other people like she just loved me. I believe in the people of the southeastern uh, Wisconsin area. I believe that we have the capability, we have the compassion and the heart space to take care of our children. The ones that are unseen and forgotten and unwanted, it's up to us to like to 
to help them and give them a voice and believe them. Believe them when they're telling us their stories. And do we really abandon children and not provide them the love and support and care that they need? Is that really what kind of community this is? Is that what kind of society we live in? The answer is no. We don't do that. But our response generally is somebody else is going to do that for me. And what I'm telling you is some of those folks need to turn around and say, maybe I need to provide some of that care and support too. These children's lives are worth it. Their lives are worth the love, the blood, the sweat, the tears that we pour into it. So it's a short window in a child's life where you can make a complete difference and change the trajectory of their entire um, adult life. People do care, um, but people don't know what's going on with their neighbor next door. It's very important to become involved because you care about what happens in your city. The more involved we get as a community in supporting the foster parents, the foster children, um, we will start to see positive impact. We'll see those numbers change. So instead of seeing 50% of inmates in a prison having been touched by foster care, the hope is that number will drop. The hope that the cost of a foster child aging out of the system, that cost of the taxpayer, that number should drop. We should start to see things reverse and thus giving hope to the situation. We don't want perfect people. We're not looking for anybody to be perfect because if they were, none of us would be foster parents, right? We just need or people, parents or parents. <laughs> we just need people who are willing to say yes. I know that the people in this community, if they're aware of a crisis, will rise to meet that crisis and figure out a way to solve it. They're not statistics. They're kids that have futures and they should, and they should have a hope for their future. These children deserve to be loved. These children deserve to be cherished. These children deserve to have food on the table every day and a parent to come home to and someone to love them and someone to miss them. They deserve that. And if you have it in you to do something good, why would you choose not to do it? Society as a whole is a family and that we make up that family. And it's as we recognize that these are our children, that people like you and I will begin to rise to the occasion and recognize that we're the solution. You and I have a part to play on some level. As the hours pass, we're gonna do it all. 